Free software first began in 1986, and the origin of the term open source is often debated, but the modern definition as defined by the Open Source Initiative is from 1998. And while supporters of both movements often butt heads, arguing which one is more important and which one has been more helpful, both of these movements have been massive boons to both the software industry and to users alike, for all of the reasons you probably heard countless times, and we collectively refer to both of these movements as FOSS, free and open source software. But whilst no one wants these to go away, and I'm certainly in that camp as well, after all this time, is it possible that we can do something better? Well, recently, and I know I'm a little bit late to this, Bruce Perens did an interview with The Register, which they titled, What Comes After Open Source? Bruce Perens is working on it. Our licenses aren't working anymore, says Free Software Pioneer. Now, those of you that have been around the Linux space for a really long time, probably instantly recognize the name Bruce Perens. For anyone who doesn't, Bruce was the second leader of the Debian project, and under his leadership, the Debian social contract was created. He was the original author of BusyBox, and alongside Eric S. Raymond, they formed the Open Source Initiative. I know I mentioned there are these arguments between free software and open source supporters. Keep in mind, Bruce didn't start the Open Source Initiative because he hates free software. He was there with Stallman in those early days, discussing the movement, bringing it forward but he had a couple of concerns, one of them being the name. Free software is really confusing as a name, and I fully agree with that, and I feel like that should have never been the name for the movement. Also, he wanted to be a bit more friendly to corporate interests. Now, that's something I know a lot of you are going to have a disagreement with, and it seems like over the years, he sort of disagrees with his early position as well. But we'll get to that in just a bit. First of all, our licenses aren't working anymore. We've had enough time that businesses have found all the loopholes, and thus we need to do something new. The GPL is not acting the way the GPL should have done when one third of all paid for Linux systems are sold with a GPL circumvention. That's REL. It's pretty clear what his stance on the entire REL situation was. This was about Red Hat removing the general availability of the REL source code, and instead, only offering it to customers. Now, the nice thing about being a customer is if they don't like you, if you're doing something with the source code that maybe they're not a fan of, like making Rocky Linux, for example, well, you could just no longer be a customer anymore. They aren't really Red Hat any longer. They're IBM. Once again, it's very clear <laughs> what Bruce's opinion about Red Hat is. And of course, they stopped distributing CentOS, now only having CentOS Stream. And for a long time, they've done something that I feel violates the GPL. And my defamation case was about another company doing the exact same thing. They tell you that if you're a RHEL customer, you can't disclose the GPL source for security patches that RHEL makes, because they won't allow you to be a customer any longer. IBM employees assert that they are still feeding patches to the upstream open source project, but of course, they aren't required to do so. For the past six months, a year, however long it's been at this point, RHEL has been in this weird state where clearly the Red Hat lawyers think what they're doing with the GPL is totally okay, or at least they are big enough where nobody is going to try to mess with them. But it's also clear that a lot of people think that what they are doing violates the spirit of the GPL, even though it might not violate the specific terminology of the license, as is evidenced by the fact that a lot of people seem to think that RHEL is closed source now. It's not closed source, but they're only offering the source code to customers, which technically they are allowed to do. It's just not the way that most people make use of the license. This is why a lot of people, including Bruce, are calling it a loophole. This has gone on for a long time, and only the fact that Red Hat made a public distribution of CentOS, essentially an unbranded version of RHEL, made it tolerable. Now IBM isn't doing that any longer. CentOS Stream, whilst they like to say it's basically just CentOS, is a different thing to what CentOS was. CentOS was one-to-one -one RHEL, whereas CentOS Stream is an upstream of RHEL. It's a similar thing, but it's not the same. So I feel that IBM has gotten everything at once from the open source developer community now, and we've received something of a middle finger from them. Obviously, CentOS was important to companies as well, and they are running for the wings in adopting Rocky Linux. 
I could wish they went to a Debian derivative, but okay. Really, the only corporate Debian derivative is Ubuntu. Maybe they would go there, but look, most of the enterprise Linux world is Red Hat or Red Hat Forks or it's SUSE. And then Ubuntu is there as well, but it's a far smaller number in that group. But we have a number of straws that the open source camel's back will one break it. But all of that is about the enterprise use. Another straw burden in the open source camel is that open source has completely failed to serve the common person. For the most part, if they use us at all, they do so through a proprietary software company systems like Apple iOS or Google Android or Microsoft Windows or Apple Mac OS. Yes, Linux and BSD and all of these open things do exist, but they're this tiny little drop in the puddle when you compare it to the absolute scale that is these proprietary systems. And yes, technically Android is open source, but the Android that most people are running is not the open source project. It is an open source core with all of these proprietary things on top of it. As Bruce says, both of which use open source for infrastructure, but the apps are mostly proprietary. The common person doesn't know about open source. They don't know about the freedoms we promote, which are increasingly in their interest. Indeed, open source is used today to surveil and even oppress them. But if you then flip it over to the developer side, most of the tooling you use is open source. Yes, you might use a proprietary language, and yes, you might use a proprietary editor, but... When it comes to third-party libraries, most third-party libraries are open source. This is one of the very few spaces where being open is basically considered the default. And if you're not open, that's kind of weird. And it's simply because it's by developers for developers. And when you make a thing for a developer, making it open just makes it easier to work with. But by the time it makes it to the user, it's gone through all of these corporate processes and all of this nonsense that eventually turns it into this proprietary system. I know some of you might say, isn't a lot of this the fault of Bruce Prenz and Eric S. Raymond, who moved away from the free software movement, moved away from the four freedoms, and started up the open source initiative that had this more of a focus on corporate interests and the monetary value that open code can provide these companies. And I certainly think there is some merit to that. But let's not forget what the biggest license used by the open source space is, the MIT license. This didn't come from the open source initiative, this came from the X11 project 10 years before the OSI. Even if the FSF was the only open organization that existed, that license would still be around. And I don't see any reason why it wouldn't have also been adopted if companies wanted to write open code. I don't see a world where companies would have adopted a GPL style license. It just doesn't make any sense for the interests that they personally have. I certainly wish they had interests that brought them more in line with an open system, but you know, money. Money is very important to a company. So Bruce proposes a new system, a system which for now he's calling post open. I think we can work on the name. Um, it might have similar problems to free software, but for now it works as a theoretical idea. Post open, as he describes it, is a bit more involved than open source. It would define the corporate relationship with developers to ensure companies paid a fair amount for the benefits they received. It would remain free for individuals and non-profit and would entail just one license. He imagines a simple yearly compliance process that gets companies all the rights they need to use post-open software, and they'd fund developers who would be encouraged to write software that's usable by the common person as opposed to technical experts. We have discussed on very many occasions where developers just get sick of the thankless work they do, just maintaining some little library that is on top of another library, on top of another library, that is this giant stack of castle built on sand basically where if they remove their little piece everything just collapse they are being used by the fang companies and not a single one of them are paying them a cent and as annoying as it is people have to pay rent and if you aren't making any money from a project at some point a lot of people do just have to step away and do something else and maybe there is a way to deal with this system by getting money out of these companies. 
Now, pointing to popular applications from Apple, Google, and Microsoft, Ren says a lot of the software is oriented toward the customer being the product. They certainly failed a great deal and in some cases are actually abused. So it's a good time for open source to actually do stuff for normal people. The reason that often doesn't happen today, says Perens, is that open source developers tend to write code for themselves and those who are similarly adept with technology. The way to avoid that, he argues, is to pay developers so they have support to take the time to make user-friendly applications. I think a great example of this is just the Linux desktop. There is so much software out there that is really good software, don't get me wrong, but for a long time even the big desktop projects didn't have UI and UX teams, they were sort of just like winging it, and if they did have any UI and UX experience, there was no guarantee it was going to be completely followed, and the people doing it often didn't have experience in doing so, so what they put together wasn't really that great. And this is something we've been seeing changing over the past couple of years as there's been, you know, not a lot of money flowing around, but a lot more money than there has been in the past. And things are getting easier to use. Now, you do still have to do the terminal for a lot of things, and that is certainly an issue. But it is becoming a lot less of an issue than it was at one point. And Perens acknowledges that a lot of stumbling blocks need to be overcome, like finding an acceptable entity to handle the measurements and distribution of funds. What's more, the financial arrangements have to appeal to enough developers. You can't do this on an individual basis. You can't just have one developer using a license like this that says, okay, you have to pay me money. And then just having that developer trying to get money out of a company, like that's just not going to work. You need to have some sort of non-profit entity that does all of this management, that goes to the companies, that can distribute these funds. But the issue is all of this has to be transparent and adjustable enough that it doesn't fork a hundred different way he muses. So, you know, that's one of my big questions. Can this really happen? So we do have these big non-profits in the FOSS space. Places like Mozilla and the Linux Foundation. I don't trust either of these organizations with my money. Just from the reporting they need to do, I see how they spend money. And I think they waste a lot of it on things that just don't matter. On things outside of their primary focus on developing good software. And if you have an organization like this that is supposed to be managing funds that are coming from these companies and then sending them out to developers, the second that anything doesn't line up exactly like it should, the second something seems slightly off or they're spending money on something that doesn't exactly make sense, people are going to get very suspicious very quickly. And I do agree. I don't know if this can even happen but it's certainly worth at least thinking about trying. Now, regardless of whether this solution is actually viable and is actually possible, Perens argues that the GPL isn't enough. The GPL is designed not as a contract, but as a license. What Richard Storm was thinking was he didn't want to take away anyone's rights. He only wanted to grant rights. So it's not a contract, it's a license. Well, we can't do that anymore, we need enforceable contract terms. Now there have been attempts to solve part of this issue, one of those being Common Clause. That being this right here, Common Clause License Condition V1.0. The software is provided to you by the licensor under the license, as defined below, subject to the following condition. Without limiting other conditions in the license, the grant of rights under the license will not include, and the license does not grant you the right to sell the software. For purposes of the foregoing, sell means practicing any or all of the rights granted to you under the license to provide to third parties for a fee or other consideration, including without limitation fees for hosting or consulting slash support services related to the software, a product or service whose value derives entirely or substantially from the functionality of the software. Any license notice or attribution required by the license must also include this common clause license condition notice. Bruce isn't a fan of this. Why is the common clause bad, he writes. First, there's the brand problem. Open source licenses have a brand, which is the understanding of the rights they convey. And of course, 
open source has a brand too, which is the understanding of the rights in the open source definition. The common clause appears to use the open source license, but doesn't give the same rights, thus abusing the license brand for profit. Now, I will partially disagree with this. On the common clause website, they do specifically say this is not open source. Open source has a specific definition. So, yeah, if you're just looking at it from the outside, you can maybe assume that, but they don't seem to think so. Now, another problem we have is software as a service. So, AGPR, for example, makes software disclose its own source code in some way. What we're actually talking about is public performance in software, and public performance is a separate right under copyright because it was necessary for plays and films. So, we have that right under copyright and we can use it. I think those licenses are all trying to reach a goal and are partially there because they only tried to make slight changes from open source. And you know, it's 30 years we've had open source. We can consider a radical departure. So AGPL is sort of trying to shore up a hole that was there with the GPL license. It wasn't this radically different approach. This was the spirit of what the GPL was, albeit it wasn't what it initially said. And of course, how can we talk about anything in the current year without mentioning AI? Now, Bruce has a very based opinion on AI. I think that AI is always plagiarism. I think you're probably right there. Uh, but you know, there's a lot of debate about whether that's actually the case. I agree with Bruce, though. And I feel like a lot of other people do as well. When you train the model, you're training the model with other people's copyrighted stuff. And what the AI does is mix and match and output a combination of what was input. We have to consider that. How do we compensate the people whose data was used to train the model? This isn't going away, so we need a solution to deal with that problem. Should we be training it with open source software? I don't think so. But it does more than that. It reads people's websites. It reads the whole of Wikipedia. Nobody on the input side is being compensated fairly for the output. So that's a big question we have to resolve. And you know, without a shadow of a doubt, the companies that are involved in this space, like OpenAI and all of these others, are going to fight tooth the nail to make sure they don't have to pay anything for this data because if they do they will be forking out hundreds of millions of dollars and they don't want to do that but they probably should have to now the rest of the article goes off on a tangent about copyright and china and ai in china and if you want to read the rest of that for yourself go ahead and do so i do think that bruce might be onto something here i like open source I like free software, but there is a lot of companies that are abusing what exists right now, not paying anything for it, which they're totally free to do, but people have to make money, and people have bills they have to pay, and if there is a better way this can be handled, even if those other systems have served us well, maybe there is something new that we can do that can better solve the problems we have today in the landscape we exist in. I'm not smart enough to work out that problem, and Bruce is going to need a lot of lawyers to help him out to try and deal with this, but I don't know. If you guys have any thoughts about the current state of software and the way that corporations abuse what exists in open source and just don't pay anything for it, I would love to hear it. If you have maybe a solution to this problem, I would love to hear that as well. So let me know your thoughts in the comment section down below. If you like the video, go like the video. And if you really like the video and you want to become one of these amazing people over here, check out the Patreon, subscribe, and bear pay link in the description down below. That's going to be it for me and Bruce.